try to understand this land Australia Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross In her frame of peaceful seas Try to understand this land Australia Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross In her frame of peaceful seas Desolate, lifeless salt plains Nothing moves except the heat haze. Well, almost nothing. I'm on the Gulf of Carpentaria in remote northern Australia, near the coast. And this desolate type of country is perhaps what you'd expect to find. But I want to show you a different Gulf, a place of constant surprises. In fact, our starting point is a town called Mount Surprise. Near Mount Surprise, we'll explore Australia's strangest and least known natural wonder. We'll travel west through Georgetown to a legendary gold rush town called Croydon. We'll ride Australia's most isolated railway to the Normanton Bush Races. Finally, at Corumba, we'll fish the sparkling waters of the gulf itself. I can promise you no more salt plains, but much to wonder at, on the road from Mount Surprise. For a hundred years, the Gulf has been, first and foremost, cattle country. In the old days, these were about the most isolated cattle runs in Australia. It's different today. Helicopter mustering is one sign of progress, and this is another. They're called road trains. They're the undisputed kings of these cattle roads. Australia's outback is the only place in the world where they operate. 60 head and heading back on Parry, and we'll be there in about 60 hours. The job of these monster rigs is to haul cattle to ports and railheads further south. In the old days, stockmen walked the cattle down on overland treks that took months. Road trains do the same trip in a day. Less romantic, but much more practical. One of the strangest sights along this road is actually on a cattle station, a place called Talaru. As the greenery suggests, there's a waterhole here, but it's the strangest waterhole I've ever seen. Last century, a stockman riding in this area heard an explosion and the sound of gushing water. He stopped to look, and this is what he found. Talaroo hot springs, and they are hot, up to 70 degrees centigrade. Not quite boiling point, but hot enough to burn your finger. Ouch.
Tellaru Station is owned by Elizabeth and Gerard Lyons, but even they don't know where this water comes from. Well, it could be fed by a spring hundreds of kilometres away. Mm. It's um, certainly coming from underground, and the suggestion is probably six kilometres down for the temperature of water that's coming through to the surface. And this whole region is apparently relatively close to the Earth's core, and consequently it's getting heated up and just happens to come through on this weak spot. The old Cobb & Co coach road used to pass through here, so travellers have been calling it Tallaroo for over a hundred years. Some even claimed miracle cures. More practically, passing stockmen used these pools to cook their beef, so I thought I should give it a try. Traditional tucker, beef and potatoes. They've been in the water about eight hours. No idea how lovely this is. Beautiful. As you may have guessed, this is volcanic country, and this little pool is a perfect model for what I want to show you next. Imagine this is a volcano, and this a lava river. Now, imagine it all magnified on a giant scale. Millions of years ago, the Mount Surprise region was the heart of a vast system of active volcanoes. Their lava flow spread as far as the eye can see. Today, these plains hold a fascinating secret, and those dense green patches are the key. They're cave-ins, holes in the roof of an extraordinary system of underground tunnels over 50 kilometres long. The tunnels are called the Andara Lava Tubes. Still only half explored, they're already recognised as one of Australia's strangest natural features. To explore them, we'll be climbing down through the cave-ins, because that's the only way in. To visit the Andara lava tubes, I'll need some help. Here in the Gulf, that's not hard to find, thanks to a network of local experts they call Savannah Guides. Bruce Butler spends most of his time showing people the Andara system. Jerry Collins knows the tubes equally well. They're on a cattle station owned by his family and they've been exploring here for 70 years. Right, Ted, this is the first of the ones that you're going to see this um collapse here this is the first we call this the archway right here yeah. and just here without these collapses you would never know that this tube line is underneath this ground right here so we could be on one right here certainly only about three meters underneath us here right underneath the ground right beside our feet mm. that's about all it is yep well let's, let's go. go and have a look at it Whatever you expect, nothing quite prepares you for the scale of these tunnels the first time you see them. Bruce and Jerry call this the archway. This short section is one of the few places where daylight enters the tunnels, letting you see the vastness of their scale. 
The archway is 18 metres, 60 feet high, and 26 metres, nearly 90 feet across. Major flow of lava from the actual Andara crater actually followed a riverbed in the underlying granite country. It flowed down this particular riverbed, cooled very quickly on top, much like a skin on a custard. And uh, it actually, uh, as it cooled, it insulated more and more, and it kept flowing down this particular tube. When the volcano expired, the lava just ran out the end of it and left this long, hollow cylindrical tube which runs horizontally under the ground. <laughs> Andara is much more than just a local novelty. These are the best preserved lava tubes of their age in the world, and probably the longest. This second tube is typical of most of the system, dark, echoing, and vast. You could run two express trains through here, side by side. The tunnels don't stay level. Where they dip, the floor has often silted up so that the roof comes down to meet you. The chance for a closer look reveals some surprising features, including tiny stalactites. The tunnel walls show a surprising variety of colors and textures. In some places, Dripping lava has left a pattern like lacework. The cave-ins are as remarkable as the tunnels. Their moisture and shelter protect the last remnants of a rainforest that was once widespread. There are plants here that no longer survive anywhere else in the gulf. These fork ferns are both rare and ancient. Much older than the tunnels, they date back to the age of dinosaurs. So they not only survived the eruption, they found refuge in the tunnels it left behind. Our final exploration is Barker's tube. It's the longest penetrable tunnel in the system, and we're going half a kilometre in. These lights have been specially installed for our visit we're witnessing something that only a handful of people have ever seen. What a place. There's another one. Look at the bats, look. The tunnels are home to thousands of bats. This far in, the air already has a pungent smell and it's made worse when our shoes kick up dust from bat droppings. Breathing becomes quite unpleasant. You meet some other unexpected visitors down here too. In their determined search for moisture, the roots of a fig tree have found their way down through the roof and all the way to the tunnel floor. There's more life down here than you might expect. Insect life. Some species have been found that aren't known anywhere else. Others are only too familiar. One of my first thoughts coming in here was to wonder why there's no Aboriginal art in these natural galleries. Then I realised that without our lights, the tunnels would be pitch dark the kind of place Aboriginal people would absolutely avoid. Oh, 
Well, I can honestly say that was one of the greatest experiences of my life. The Andara tunnels have only just been opened to visitors. I wonder how many people travelled through here in the past and never knew what a strange subterranean world lay just beneath their feet. These hills hide another of the Gulf's secrets, gold. Mind you, it's hidden in an awful lot of gulf. Even so, prospectors have come here looking for gold since the 1870s. The country around Georgetown is littered with relics of the search, and they tell me this country still yields gold. We're heading from Georgetown to Croydon, travelling the old Gold Rush Trail. There are plenty of signs of progress along the way, but you also see a great deal that has survived from earlier days. In fact, that's one of the fascinations along this road. In most parts of Australia, you'd be hard-pressed to find buildings like this. Here, they still stand where they always have. Vivid links for the time when the Gulf was much more remote than it is today. The rush started in 1885, and life on the field was tough and harsh. Drought the first year, typhoid the next, but there was gold, and the hopeful diggers came in droves. By the 1890s, a thriving city had grown up here, literally in the middle of nowhere. A commuter train even ran to Croydon suburbs. As on every great field, they said Croydon streets were paved with gold. For a while, maybe they were. Pat Wilson's store is one of the few survivors from gold rush days, as you'll see. It's no ordinary store. And uh, some sugar. Pat's shop has never stopped trading. Perhaps that's why stepping inside is like stepping back in time. It's no ordinary show you've got here, the store. No, it's pretty old. Any chance of a look around? Oh, yeah, of course. That's the other side and we'll go to the museum. It's the other side of Pat's store that really takes you back a hundred years. These shelves only stock the goods of the past. And most of the things that are in the museum here now would have been sold from this store in the early days. I suppose and they would, yeah. They're gradually coming back in now. It's yeah. Poetic justice. Yeah. Who, who's collected all this over the years? 
Oh, well, a lot of it was in the store here that had, uh, had stayed in the store. And then people from the town brought in things when they knew there was going to be a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, the old till there belonged to the butcher shop, one of the butcher shops in town. Mm. A beautiful piece of equipment. And the scales here, uh, they were actually used in the store here to weigh the gold when it was brought in because the miners used to charge, you I know. I suppose that was the currency, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Goodness. They used to bring in their gold and then they'd get supplies. Uh, and check up for any lead yeah. weights on the one side, <laughs> did you? <laughs> Most likely. <laughs> the scales there, the ordinary shops go. No, that was, yeah, that's a Buddha, a mm. brass Buddha that was found out of the area around here and brought in by, guess what that Wish, is? Uh, sausage machine. Oh. <laughs> is it? Not too many people know it's a, a sausage machine, oh, yes. Sort of chap I am, walking encyclopedia. <laughs> So what's this, a Croydon shopping trolley, is it? Well, if you want to fill it with groceries, you can. Okay. No. <laughs> this was used to pull the ore up from the Federation mine. That's a meat mine. hanger. It used to hang the meat on the hooks here and fill the funnel with water so that the ants couldn't walk across. Mm -hmm. And then that, that way they... This is a grater, see how it works? It pushes oh, yeah. the cheese through. By the 1920s, Croydon's reefs had produced by today's values half a billion dollars worth of gold. But by then, most of the gold was gone. At Croydon's height, 6,000 people lived here. Today, the entire population of Croydon Shire is less than 400. Croydon once had 30 pubs. Today, there's just one. Not quite a ghost town. Croydon is surrounded by the ghosts of her past. Relics of an age that vanished long ago. Relics of a town of golden memory. Treat her with respect, she has a tale to tell. A tale for you and me. A tale of history A lonely shack reminds us all of better days Long ago, a ruin now But think of what those walls would surely know An engine which beat like a heart when gold was found The rusty winch that took the sturdy miners underground they came here full of hope in Croydon's golden past. They couldn't understand their fortunes would not last. A lonely chimney, smokeless now, abandoned shaft. In silence where once men and women worked and children laughed. Relics of an age that vanished long ago. Relics of a town of golden memory Treat her with respect, she has a tale to tell A tale for you and me A tale of history A tale for you and me A tale of history But Croydon isn't quite dead yet, despite the pain a mine abandoned yesteryear is yielding gold again. Yielding gold again. Hardly a gold rush, but one mine is back in action here. How well is it doing? How long will it last? As with most gold fields, no one can say. The gold rush brought the railway to Croydon as far back as 1891. 
a line built in the kind of rush of blood to the head that so often comes with gold. But lines like this often vanish too. The Gulflander is still in business. Not bad for a train they first talked about closing down as far back as 1910. Today, they use a rail motor, not a steam engine. But thanks to the flat top, it's a very practical way of getting us from Croydon here to Normanton, and still 150 kilometres west. Built to link the gold fields with the ports of the Gulf, this railway doesn't link up with any other line. It was going to, but the connecting links were never built. The Gulflander remains Australia's most isolated railway. Cut off from the rest of the railway system, the Gulflander still provides a genuine link between two very remote outback towns. And that, of course, is part of its charm. Today, the Gulflander runs just once a week, rocking and rolling along at 50 kilometres an hour. The journey to Normanton takes four hours, but at least the train still runs. What kept it running? One answer is that this train became so much part of the Gulf that no one was ever game to close it down. Some said that without the train, the towns at either end of the line would go back to bush. Whether that's right or not, the Gulflander survived long enough to become an institution. Today, the train's future looks good. This trip is recognised as one of the great little railway journeys of the world. In fact, for a regular service, it offers something more sophisticated railways would like to match. A rare combination of business and pleasure. Everyone seems to enjoy a trip on the Gulflander, but no one more than the driver, Carl Shepard. The beauty of it is, is you're there with the people are are sitting right next to you and they come and talk to you and ask you different things as you're going along and it's a uh, it's sort of the, the next step from the steam engine for mine you know you can hear the, the engine noise right next to you and it, when it comes under load and goes off load and yeah it's uh, and the clickety clack of the wheels and the bangs and kicks with it go along with it Twice a week, Tanya Quirk and her daughter Chrissy meet the Gulflander with refreshments for the passengers. Living nearby on Mayvale Cattle Station, the train has always brought them mail and supplies. But Tanya and Chrissy are also fulfilling a long tradition. Someone from Mayvale has been bringing refreshments down to the Gulflander ever since the line first opened in 1891. Folks, we're approaching Black Bull. There'll be uh, about a 10 minute break here so you can get yourself a, uh, a nice piece of homemade cake and a, a cool drink of course. You. And for not really Black Bull, we're uh, virtually head straight through then to Normanton. I've seen more palatial refreshment rooms but none to better the service or atmosphere of Black Bull siding. It's one more unexpected touch on a most unusual journey. Yeah, 
Yeah, work him this get him bush. Whoop. Go back behind the joint. There, hit him bush. Good one. Colin Casey and his team work full time to keep the track maintained. Back in the 1880s, the designer of this line faced a real challenge, termites. They eat everything in the bush, including wooden railway sleepers. The answer they came up with was hollow steel sleepers packed with earth and laid directly on the ground. They've worked well for a hundred years, yet to my knowledge, They've never been tried anywhere else in the world. Finally, the town of Normanton. Terminus for the Gulf Land. What a great little train. I can only hope that it keeps running for another hundred years. Normanton was just about the first town in the Gulf, settled as a river port back in the 1860s. In those days, if you needed groceries, all you had to do was send an order down south and then wait until your ship came in. On average, that took about three years. These days, Normanton is a center for the cattle industry in the Gulf. But the town preserves its past in some fine old buildings and some fine old pubs. The purple, the central, and my bed for the night, the Albion. It's going to be a big day in Normanton, and that means an early start. It's the day of the annual bush races. Trainers and jockeys have arrived in town overnight, and most important of all, so have the horses. Put it right up, mate. This is what they call a Calcutta, and it's probably my best chance of a win today. In a Calcutta, they auction off the horses in a particular race. If you buy the winning horse, you win all the money in the pool. Not knowing the local form, I guess it's as good a bet as any. At thirty dollars left hand side, at thirty, left hand side, at thirty, at thirty now, no, at thirty dollars now, at thirty dollars now. Any more advance than thirty dollars. Any more at forty in the right hand side, at forty at forty, any more advance than forty dollars. At forty dollars now, at forty dollars. Any more at fifty on the left hand side now. At fifty dollars, at fifty dollars, any more advance than fifty dollars. How do we knock them out quick now? And I tell you, I can knock them out once, twice, three, all done, three times, Ted Legan, thanks very much. Outspoken. Well, you never know your luck in the big smoke. Come on, 
Like all bush races, this is a social occasion for many and a serious business for some, particularly in the betting ring. Here on the local for birthdays, Eddie's preference for 160 to 80. But a missing in action is 120 to 28. Local priority, 20 to 10. 819, the grass is 16 to 1. Outspoken is certainly being well groomed. I'd say he's looking good, and he's in good hands with a lady jockey. I wonder what she thinks our chances are. Oh, I reckon he's got a big chance. <laughs> yeah, he's a fair sort of a horse. Won one race in Townsville. Led a field of 12. So you think he's got a show? Well, he'll make it hard for the rest of them. <laughs> yeah. That way. <laughs> Double tyres in liner. M Pauly four. The tension's building. Outspoken's price is shortening. I must say, all the signs are looking good. Now the brass has gone in. They're all in line. Set to race now. Racing. Great start to Lothario Lad, one of the best with Fiery Kalala. Kalali then comes Elbow going fast. Running third then on the fence is Sound of Brass. Here comes the Lord Derby winner, Lothario Lad, being set alight quickly. Around the outside is Fiery Kalali, a break back then to Dollar a Day. On this outside is Outspoken and Double Tie is the trailer. On the home turn now on the Jim White Memorial Golf Cup. First to turn is Alpha, but Lothario Lad got up fast in the centre. Lothario Lad's got the lead now. Fiery Kalali yeah, next over on the fence, followed by Outspoken. Now the outside is do Double Tie. Then comes Dollar a Day, but it's all Lothario Lad. Lothario Lad drawn about three or four legs in front down the running and Lothario Lad is a great winner. Lothario Lad wins the Jim White Memorial Cup. Third, second place in the outspoken. Third, double tie. Then came Dollar a Day, pulled in by Fiery Kalali. Elfo was next. And a long last to come in is Sound of Brass. Oh, well, apparently we just weren't quite outspoken enough on the day. Still, you can't complain about second place. Right at the start, I promised you no more salt plains. I didn't say the country might not get a bit flat. But don't worry, there's a real surprise coming up. It's the sudden change from the dry scrublands back there to the blue waters of the Gulf that makes arriving here such a contrast. And there are more surprises in town. This is Karumba, the town they call the Outback by the Sea. You can see why. There was always a small settlement here, but the town has mushroomed in the last 30 years. What happened here in the mid-1960s was like a modern gold rush. That's when the almost untapped gulf was found to contain one of the treasures of the sea. These fellas. Call it a prawn, call it a shrimp. Either way, they're solid gold. And the gulf is one of the richest prawning waters of the world. Grumba today lives for prawns. It's the supply base for a huge fishing industry centred on the gulf. 
For a long time, the Gulf was Australia's most underestimated waterway. It's a shallow, tropical sea, and it teems with life. Over 200 trawlers converge on the Gulf for the prawning season. Each boat is worth a million dollars plus. Mind you, prawns aren't the only treasure in these seas. There are men who fish the rivers of the Gulf on a very different scale to the prawners. Their catch is a no less famous delicacy, barramundi. The barramen are the characters of the Gulf and we're going upriver to meet them. Duck Creek is just a few hours up the coast from Karumba. It's a tidal estuary, a haunt for barramundi and the men who fish for them. Barra fishermen usually work alone, a day-long round of setting and checking nets. In high season, a day's catch could be 90 fish. I'd be lucky to find anyone with time to chat. So I've come late in the year, and all we're really out to do is catch a feed for dinner. Not only barramundi get caught up in these nets, some accidental catches need to be handled with great care. A stingray has a nasty barb in his tail, and getting him disentangled is no easy job. Stingrays aren't the greatest danger. The barra men also share these estuaries with the deadliest manhunters of all, saltwater crocodiles. So do you ever get a croc in there? Yeah, now and again we do, like, like not so much the big fellas, but probably about 11 foot, 10 foot or something like that, you'll get them snagged up in this, this roll, you know. So what do you do? Oh, you sort of, you sort of wait until they drown and try and get them out. I'll treat them with great respect. <laughs> Don't think you can do. Yeah. do. Do they ever come along and try and rob your catch? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, they, they take fish out of our nets. Yeah. Lots of times you check your net, there's one big bugger up here, the other end take the fish out. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> when you come to a net, you see a big head and you just go down and he'll come up behind you while you're working your net. Yeah. So they get a bit cheeky. Most barra men camp ashore, but a few spend the whole season afloat. Mm. Their boats become home, transport and factory, all rolled into one. Where'd you go? Two. Two? Two. Oh, an awful bit, eh? Yeah, I think they're finished this year. <laughs> <laughs> we only got two? Yeah, a couple there. Oh, we got a barra for tonight, that's for sure. Artie is not only coming to dinner, he's taking me in search of our second course. Yet another golf delicacy, Mud crab. These men take care of their river. They don't take undersized crabs, and females, jennies, go back to the water to ensure future supplies. Crabs for the market are sent out alive. That means crabbers like Artie have to learn a particular skill, tying mud crabs to neutralise claws that could easily take off a human finger. The worry is, Artie's only showing me how to do it because he thinks I should give it a try. Push it out like that, then pull it. You pull it in tight. If they come loose, they, they come undone. Mm -hmm. And then they, uh, when they get loose, they just chew the others. You got it there now, Tad? <laughs> we'll soon find out. Yeah, push him away with your stick like this to back to you. Yeah. And then just come from behind. Pick him up like that. Right. And then stick him on the seat and... Okay, so I'll distract his attention yeah. there. That's about it. 
That's for sure. Put him on there. Put your foot on him. Come on, whatever. And away we go. That's it. That's it. Yeah. The real gourmet stuff, eh? Barramen and crabbers are a breed apart. Their lifestyle is quite a sharp contrast to the mechanised world of the modern prawn trawlers. Nine months of the year they work from riverbank camps like this. Going to town for supplies about once a month. They need to get on together, otherwise the life would be hard to take. My first go? Yeah. He's not felt a rock, but he's not tired. He didn't think he had. Some would call this a tough lifestyle. Others would say it's idyllic. But no one could call this meal anything less than a banquet. We'll give you another one. Right. The wet season will start soon, and they'll pack up their camp until next year. But they'll be back and I can see why. They forgo a few luxuries here, but not the one luxury they value most of all, their independence. Should have a tourist resort here, Rex. I think we will, eh? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not gonna be the bloody cook. <laughs> <laughs> Me either, gonna, we'll get a cook. One each, one each. I'll go catching them, we'll get a cook, cook it. <laughs> well, they say I always pay, so pay for your bloody supper, I might sing you a song, eh? Oh, yeah, very good. good. Oh, that's... I couldn't resist after. The experience is here, this is a little one I've come up with. Tempo Devolves. While we're here at Duck Creek, and we might stay for a week, cos we're all in the mood to rage on. There's, there's Hardy and Rex, and don't forget Johnny, and a handsome young fella named Ron. <laughs> we eat the day's catch of barra and mud crabs. We all share a beer and a song. And Hardy regales us with tales about vanguards and how they <laughs> are ever so strong. <laughs> that, 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 we're here at Duck Creek, we might stay for a week. Cos we're all in the mood to rage on. Unreal, I mean, you just caught me with my pants down. At the start of this journey, I promised you a road of surprises. I hope. That's what it's turned out to be. But there's something more to the magic of this trip, and for that matter, to the gulf itself. This is still traveller's country, not tourist country. Still a bit off the beaten track. So maybe that's why there's a special feeling in the air. What kind of feeling? I'd call it freedom. Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful seas. Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries Mother of us all, beneath the sun 